listeners, viewers, welcome to uh, another edition of uh, Blighty Talk Bricks. Um, the guest I've got today is somebody I've known for um, over 30 years. Um, he's someone that uh, for sure is extremely well respected in the industry. Um, I've had the, the good pleasure of working on a couple of projects with him in the past. Um, and you would have also noticed that um, I'm wearing a football shirt. Uh, the football shirt is red and white. I've done something I have um, have done before, which is go to eBay, and I have bought football shirts on eBay. But on this occasion, I bought an opposing team's football shirt, but I'm wearing this Southampton shirt because, uh, just as a mark of respect, really, for my guest today, he's a really passionate guy. He's passionate about his football team, Southampton, and he's very passionate about the industry. So without further ado, let me introduce you to my special guest today, Mr. Peter Truscott, CEO of Crest Nicholson. Peter, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Really nice to be here, and, and I love the shirt. Um, <laughs> now, Southampton fans know that shirt very well because we call it the Danish pyjamas. <laughs> and this was funky at the time, wasn't it? This was really out there. It, it was, because, and, and it was also controversial because up until then, of course, we only wore red and white stripes, and this, this was the first change. And I think this was the shirt in 87 to 89. For me, I went to the Dell at those times. Uh, Alan Shearer, certainly on one of my visits, was with you guys at that time. And he certainly knew how to put the ball in the net, didn't he? Yeah, I remember Alan Shearer, Shearer very well. I went to the game against Arsenal, funnily enough, when he made his debut as a 17-year-old and scored a hat-trick. Uh, after that, though, um, he couldn't score. He went quite a few games without scoring. I just thought, this guy's a lump, he'll never make it. <laughs> <laughs> is that where your scouting football career ended then, is it, after that? Yeah, it, it was, because I also didn't rate Bale. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I suppose he was a left-back at the time for you, wasn't he? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, but, but you mentioned Alan Shearer. Um, what I do remember is going to an FA Cup game against Bolton, fifth round of the FA Cup, home to Bolton. I couldn't get in the ground. This is before all tickets, so I had to go into the Bolton end. Um, and Alan Shearer scored a cracking goal in the first minute. I just, I just remember that and the respect that the Bolton fans were giving him on the day. Well, I'm, I'm lucky enough to actually know Alan, and um, I can vouch not only is he, was he amazing as a footballer, but he's also a top, lovely guy. But my next question to you is, why Southampton, why not Arsenal? Why was it Southampton that you followed? I was actually born in Southampton, although I grew up uh, in Australia, coming back uh, to UK when, when I was 13. Um, I was born in Southampton, and when we came back to the UK, lived in Southampton, or at least near Southampton for a while, then was sent up to live in Scotland, funnily enough, with, um, uh, with, with, with uh, uh, auntie, because we didn't have a house. One of the reasons I'm quite passionate about um, housing because I was actually, as a youngster, uh, technically homeless. We, was we, really? lived, we, we lived in uh, a couple of caravans. There were nine of us, and we lived in a couple of caravans in an auntie's garden. Um, but funnily enough, in Scotland, I, I was there for about six months and went to school there. After a while, I thought my name was English Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Is that so? Which was particularly insulting because I thought that I was Australian at the time. Whereabouts in Scotland? Cooper in Fife. Right, OK, so not far away from St Andrews. That's right, absolutely. Yeah, well, golfing, so it's uh, a mecca up there. Funny enough, I was talking to someone and they met Cooper, I mean, mentioned it, so that's twice in two days that somebody's mentioned that place. Unbelievable. So, Scotland, Australia, I get the Southampton bit at the beginning. Um, how did you get into the property industry? Uh, pure chance. Uh, I actually started out, um, and this is a brilliant link, my first job was at Draper Tools. Was uh, it really? Yes, it was. Are they and still going? Yeah, yeah, still. still Are going. they really? Still based um, near Southampton. And I was there for four years, and I was, I was doing sales. I was doing, um, selling German power tools, funnily enough, and... Um, I can still remember the names of the spare parts in German, <laughs> so how sad it was. But um, I left to join a smaller company. It didn't work out. They didn't like me. Um, <laughs> and I ended up uh, losing my job. And I went to the job centre to look for a new job and got a job working in the job centre on the front desk. Um, that's, that's, that's true. That's true. And I was there for about a month. And uh, a couple of guys came in from Wimpy and they were looking for a trainee mm. land buyer. And one of the qualifications you had to have was O-level geography, which I had. And as it happens, to my eternal shame, I was the only applicant. Was you really? 
Yeah. And is that where you started? Because I think I, started, I yeah. think the first time I came across you thirty um, odd years ago was at Carla. Yeah, I started out at Wimpy. I was there ten years before joining Carla. Was you really? And ten I started years? out as a trainee in the land department. So I owe you an apology then, because once somebody said to me, "When did you meet Peter?" and I said, "When he was a junior land bar at Carla." So I'd probably insulted you that that way, hadn't I? Yeah, I'd moved on a bit <laughs> by that time. <laughs> And so how long was you... So it just it literally, that's how it came about. That's how it came about. Pure happenstance. Pure happenstance. And then left TW? Or, or, or was it just Wimpy it was, at the time? It was Wimpy Holmes at the time. It then became George Wimpy. And, and then, of course, Taylor Wimpy in the, um, in, in the period after 2007 when they merged with Taylor Woodrow. But I was uh, in between, I was at Carla for three years, uh, right. which was interesting because uh, a completely different business model um, yep. did things differently. It was much more uh, entrepreneurial, hit and miss, whereas Wimpy was very disciplined. Um, uh, you know, a good boss, Jill Parkinson. Yeah, really uh, well, if, do, you, do you still see Jill? Uh, not for a while. Probably five or six years since I've actually seen her, probably spoken to her maybe two, three years ago, something like that. Right. But, um, she was a good operator, wasn't she? Jill I mean, I don't know if she does now. Good boss. Um, lovely lady as yeah. well. Lovely smile. I remember she had a lovely smile. A a absolutely. Um, but then I went back to Wimpy. They were going to open three new business divisions. And um, I, I like the, the discipline around Wimpy. I like the way that the business worked. And um, I was determined that I was going to get one of these new land director roles. So I got the job uh, in Leicester, working in the East Midlands. Right. Um, and what, did you move up to that part of the world Yes, then? I did. Yeah, moved right. to... Um, uh, it was on the Northampton-Leicestershire border. Um, and I was in that office. It was a start-up, um, brilliant MD, guy called Mike Diffin, taught me that you could be a great boss without ever shouting at anybody. Uh, Mike was such a knowledgeable and nice guy that nobody would ever let him down. You worked for him because he was a brilliant boss. And and that was a really good lesson, I thought. Well, it's interesting you say that. I mean, in, in I mentioned in my unveiling at times, uh, and I'm not proud of it, at times I've shouted at people. Um, I'm not sure that's the culture that exists today. I think certainly in our football worlds, I mean, if you talk to previous football managers... They say about you can't go into that dressing room and give it the hairdryer treatment like Sir Alex did. is a, is a different way now. And it's, it's lovely to hear that yeah. that's, that resonated with you at that time. Yeah, I've, I, I can honestly say that in my professional career, I've never shouted at anybody. I, I do a good line in sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> I think people will, will, will attest to. But, I mean, I take quite a binary attitude. If, if people are good enough to work in a business with you, then you've got to back them and treat them with respect. If they're not good enough, it's pointless shouting at them. It's better just to ask them to go and work somewhere else where yeah. they might be better suited and, and bring in somebody that can do, can do that role. And so your time at Taylor Wimp, obviously it went well at Leicester yeah. in, in that region. It, it, it was a brilliant business. As, as a start-up, we were amongst the most profitable businesses within two or three years. Um, that helped me because we were then looking for a new managing director in the Northwest business. Uh, so I put my name forward for that. Didn't really expect to get the job, but just one of those occasions when the interview went quite well. It was more than one person this time, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, the interview went quite well. I... I Got a good connection with Mick O'Sullivan, who was the yeah, chairman at the time, um, and I got offered the role. Uh, I didn't move up there initially. I stayed um, hotels, that kind of thing. Yeah, and then and then I bought a flat in Cheshire and and commuted, um, and I was there for three years. And we just had a brilliant team. I mean, there was an element of luck in that the the market was moving north. Yeah. You know the cycle. You know, yeah. House price inflation was moving north. We bought land well and we bought it quickly, um, grew the business. The profitability was coming through. We, we actually made, at the time, in the third year, the highest profit that any wimpy business had ever made. Really? Um, but it did come as a huge surprise, given that I'd only been an MD for three years when I was offered a divisional MD role, what would now be called a divisional chairman role, um, when Mike Tanner retired and Mick O'Sullivan, my boss, Moved south, and I took his his role in the um, in in the Midlands. So, so when you say that, it always interests me when I see growth patterns of people. So, when you said you were surprised that you got uh, 
or the, the, the role that you got and it moved on. Do, do you ever doubt yourself? Does that ever cross your... Do you ever sit there and think, oh, I didn't expect to get that. I've got it and, oh my God, how am I going to deal with this? I didn't think, oh my God, how am I going to deal with it? It was a genuine surprise. But um, yes, of course, uh, I doubt myself occasionally. We, we all do. Um, I don't think you're human if you if you don't. And if you don't doubt yourself and question some of the things you do, you're just going to make more mistakes. What would what would you use? It's interesting. One of the things I, I, I tried to talk to guests, I suffer a little bit with my mental well-being, as, as, as we've talked about in the past, Pete, but what mechanisms do you use to, if you have that that morning, I don't know, you get up in the morning, you think, oh, is there any, any particular mechanisms? Or you just look at yourself in the mirror and say, right, come on, we got this. I've never, ever got up and thought, I don't want to go to work. Um, I, I always think that, you win some, you lose some. you just got to win more than you lose. I never have an expectation that things won't go wrong. There are always going to be things that go wrong, but I always think things go right too, and, and that's what keeps you going because the feeling you get when things go right, and I tend not to over-celebrate when things go right because I, I then don't want to get too too worked up when things go wrong. Yeah. Um, but but you've, you've just got to be realistic. Not everything goes well. It's, it's going back to the football analogy... You know, unless you're the very best team in the middle of a purple patch, you're not going to win every game. No. That's how we are. And, and it's it's interesting. I mean, when I say about that meeting you back in the day when you was at Carla, the, we, we had a, a spell where our career paths didn't cross for a, a number of years. And then the next, you were unrecognisable. And I don't mean that f- from a physical appearance. I just, when I bumped out, just, you just moved on, Pete. You just become... Um, so well you operated so well and you always seemed in control and calm and and i know that the people worked for you and and today even just respected you greatly you did a great job and it's just it's just interesting for me to watch from a distance yeah it it helps if you've got good people and starting off with with the job in manchester um in in the northwest division um we had some good people. They just hadn't been really well led, that's all. They didn't have confidence. And because I'd come from a land background, um, it's tough buying land anywhere, but it's tougher buying it in the south. And when you move to the Midlands, for example, um, the tactics and aggression that we used in the south was was going to win in the Midlands and then also in the northwest. So... Those experiences you take from really tough environments, which yeah. buying land of the south of England was, did give us a competitive advantage, which meant that the people in our team then had more confidence about our ability to be winners. And from a business that was always giving excuses as to why it wasn't successful, we, we had a winning formula. And, and talking about winning formulas and, and getting me on to uh, the real reason, other than it's always lovely to see you... Um, <laughs> what what are we going to do with this multi-billion dollar question in terms of what a Great Britain PLC going to do with their housing crisis? It's a huge issue um, and it's a political minefield. I've, I've got a few ideas as to how we can depoliticise it, but let's just start with the numbers. I, I don't think we've built enough homes in this country for at least a generation and possibly two generations. I, yeah. I think the number's banded about whether it's three million under supply, four million, it is a huge amount of, yeah. of homes that are needed. You know, we've got 68 million souls in this country at the moment yeah. and there is a moral obligation to house them. You know, if we are not prepared as a nation to house people, then we need to do something about immigration and if we do something about immigration, then we've got to accept that there's going to be an economic um, issue because we need a younger population to be paying for the pensions as the nation ages. So we've got to start off with that debate about do we want to be as wealthy as we are or are we prepared to be poorer? It's a choice. We might prepare, be prepared to be poorer, in which case we don't need a younger population to, to home and feed um, the older population, uh, we don't therefore need immigration, we therefore don't need the houses. The other thing, though, is about innovation and, and economic growth. Sometimes I think that the way that we're growing the economy is just throwing more 
people at it instead of being smarter, um, more productive, uh, and we've become less productive over time. There's more red tape. So we can grow the economy with fewer people. But let's just go back to the beginning. There are 68 million souls. We haven't built enough homes. We're three or four million short. And we've got to do something about it because that is the here and now. The problem is, of course, the people that make the decisions, whether they're politicians or the people that generally vote, already have a home. And quite understandably, they don't want to see those green fields near them developed. I mean, yep. it's an emotional issue. I can understand why that is. But politicians have got a moral duty to resolve this problem and to make tough decisions. They get elected on a program of, 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 of policies which has to include housing and, and I think, frankly, they've copped out of that. They, they've taken soft decisions for short-term political gain and, and that's both parties because I think the Conservatives have struggled to get their heads around the quantity needed. They make excuses about, well, what we really need is brownfield development and a uh, high rise and in city centres. Well, I'm sorry, there aren't many of those in the places at the highest demand in, in the south of England. There might be in Bradford, Stoke-on-Trent, um, Hull or Middlesbrough, but yep. certainly not in the south of England. There's not swathes of brownfield land that nobody wants to develop. So that's not going to work. And, and Labour more recently, you know, just with the decision that they made about blocking the, um, the, the, the bill to solve the nutrients problem, just short-term politicking and forgetting about people's lives and their livelihoods. 150,000 homes locked up because of the nutrients issue. Of those, 35 to 40,000 are affordable homes. That's 35 to 40,000 homes that people should be living in that somebody's just taken a political decision to block a bill that would unlock that. And that's not good enough. How do we... And, and, and by the way, I totally concur with everything you've said and uh, that's part of the reason that this podcast is out there. How do, how do the politicians... I mean, I, I, I saw recently you had an article in The Telegraph that the headline was you, you'd sort of ripped into Labour a little bit. Um, how do the politicians take you? Because I'm, I'm assuming occasionally you get the opportunity to, to sit and present to them. Do, they, do, they, do you think they, they take you seriously? Is it something that they're worried about? I mean, firstly, just in respect to that article, uh, I, I think that the headline wasn't necessarily reflective of the, of the whole interview or the whole, um, okay. the whole article. I think what I was saying is I don't think that Labour's policies are necessarily bad. I just don't think they're going to make a difference in the short term. Right. And in the short term, we have the issue that has to be resolved. We do. Um, I, I think with all politicians, you know, I have some sympathy for them because they've got all sorts of voices in their ears around this issue. And not unsurprisingly, they want to listen to those that are going to give them a message with the least political pain. Hence, when somebody says, look, you can have... A resolution to the housing crisis, but you know it's not going to affect the voters in the south of England. I can see why politicians say, "I'll have that plan then, please," yeah. but they don't necessarily work out that it isn't going to work. And and would I be right in saying? I mean, I'm nearly sixty. I, I suppose I've had an interest in politics since I was probably fourteen, if I'm honest. So I'll say modern day. I won't say forever. I just get the impression that the present government, uh, and 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 it doesn't it doesn't matter whether it's left or right, but I think that they have been um, so poor in looking at the housing issue. It just seems to be not so. I mean, the last the, the autumn budget, the autumn statement, nothing was mentioned about something that. I, I worry about my grandchildren. Pete, you know, my my kids are okay. I worry about my grandchildren. Where the bloody hell... If you take the migration situation, you know, net migration last year, 700-odd thousand. We might have built 200,000 properties. We haven't built any more. So we're already 500 wrong there, plus whether it's the 3 million or 4 million. And I just don't see that there's any... It doesn't seem to me there's any traction to have the conversation. No, there's a phrase that politics trumps economics, and I think that's that's the problem here. And I think the, the politics in the Conservative Party is is the issue, and that you've got a rump of 30 or 40 politicians who, um, over their dead bodies, will they see 
reform in the planning system that is going to release more greenfield land in in the Tory heartlands in, in, in southern England. And it's very difficult for this party, this government particularly, to do something about that when they run the risk of, of getting outvoted on it. Yeah. And, and that, that group um, and one of the leading members, Theresa Villiers, what I'd be saying to them is just be careful what you wish for because if in the end enough people become disenfranchised that they decide to go and vote for somebody else because they really do want and need a house um, and they elect a Labour government, you're going to get the housing anyway. Um, but you might not even get the housing that you want. You know, there is a risk, and as somebody that lived in a council house, I can say this, that we just end up with another programme of huge council house building. Um, and, and that's not the answer either, because the answer is mixed communities. It has to be. Has to be. Each and every location has to be a mix, a mix of private housing of different sizes, uh, of, of private rent, and of affordable homes, and, and probably elderly persons' homes as well. It, it's mixed communities that we need, not large swathes of either private-only or affordable-only housing. Because you know what happens in the future. Um, the local authorities at some point will run short of money, and they won't maintain them properly, and you end up with the sink estates that we've had that were built quickly in the 50s and 60s that yep. ended up being knocked down in the 90s and 2000s. Yep. Well, I come from one of those council estates as well, so I, I get that. It, I mean, it's for me, what I'm seeing today is the passionate Pete. I know whether it's passionate about Southampton or whether it's passionate about the industry. Do we in the industry, Pete, do enough? I mean, you've mentioned a number of things there, that Section 106. Do we in the, the industry promote ourselves enough not not us as individuals but the industry for the good that we do for the things that we deliver that i think get forgotten or just pushed over yeah there are two things about that i mean the, the answer is no we don't I, I i think there have been times when we've tried to um but i uh, i shouted down because house building is not popular as i said i can understand why because Local communities see those cherished green fields and green spaces in their area being developed and, and don't like that. I wouldn't like it. I, I can understand it entirely. So I don't think we're ever going to be popular, but I don't think that we're understood either. And, and, and particularly if you think about you know, the, 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 the one thing that nobody ever mentions, if, for me it's the elephant in the room, we don't actually manufacture people. We don't make the people. No. Um, the people are here. We, we, we just house them. So in a local community, when the objection is that there, you know, if we create this development, there's going to be more traffic on the road, more children that are going to use the local school, doctor's surgery is going to be full. I'm sorry, folks, but these people already live there. We're, we're spreading them out perhaps a little bit further. Very occasionally, people will move into the area from somebody else, somewhere else, but then... Clearly, they're moving out, somebody else moving into that area. Yeah. We are not creating the people and the demand. We're actually resolving the problem. Because without the house building, you're not getting the extra education contribution, the extra open space, those road improvements, uh, the, the contribution towards new doctor's facilities. Say, so the people are here. We're actually helping um, by, by funding some of those facilities that will be needed anyway with or without the housing. Well, it's, it's quite interesting because I had a conversation with someone the other day and was talking about the podcast and we were talking about how we don't promote stuff. And this guy, who I know not very well, and he, he, he was quite um, strong in his view that, well, you don't do anything and you never build the school and you never put the infrastructure in it. And I said, well, hold on, why do you automatically assume that that's the house builder's fault? Why don't you actually, maybe it's the planning department's trouble maybe it's they're not dealing with an issue it's but i'd say sometimes i think we just get put in the basket as we're all horrible nasty developers and we don't care about anything which is totally the opposite we we get that quite a lot actually uh you hear it played out in the press and you hear it played out when you meet politicians around the fact that we don't provide the infrastructure we don't provide it timorously um, and, and we don't provide funding for it either. We're, ju we're just the problem. The other one is beauty, so I'll come back to that in, in, in a moment. Um, so they naively think that what you can do is go and build a school with, with nobody to live in it or, or build a shop 
um, with no customers. Of course, you've got to build the homes first to generate the children for uh, to to occupy the school or to um, use the the shops and other facilities. It, it's always going to be the case that the provision of the infrastructure has to come hand in hand with the housing, not not beforehand. It's just unreal, un, unrealistic, and economically illiterate to think that it could be any other way. The other one that I love is the discussion around beauty. And I think this is number one of the politicians' cop-outs uh, in that, um, you know, well, of course, if only you built beautiful homes, then we would <laughs> welcome them. All of our constituents yeah. would welcome them, um, which which is just nonsense, really. Um, when you look at the quality of what the industry produces now compared to anything that's been produced in any of the periods, um, probably prior to the mid-Victorian period, it is significantly better in terms of quality um, and and the the, the design. Um, I mean, I often play this game with um, my partner Maria when we go and visit another town, and and we instantly, it's it's like a, a sort of orange peel as you go around any town. Uh, you know, you go through the oh here's the um, the 1990s PPG three, and here's the sort of 1980s with the brown windows and. Here's the yep. 1970s, the 1960s, the 1930s, um, the late Victorian. It's been the case that standard house types have been around in every town and city in the country um, since the mid-Victorian period with the coming of the railways. As soon as you could yep. move materials around the country, everything became the same. Yep. Uh, so we're, we're no different in this period. We just create new developments that are of our period. So going back to the the, the, the crisis, um, if I said to you, okay, well, I've just topped up, not only am I wearing my Southampton shirt, but I've got a little wand here and I've just made you in charge of the crisis because I believe it's a crisis with these numbers. Um, what three things would you actually say, right, Blighty, these are the top of my wish list that I'm going to go along to Downing Street, um, you know, and I'm going to actually, these are the things I'm going to put in play. Yeah, resolving the housing crisis is not actually difficult. It just needs political will. The very first thing that I would do would be to reintroduce top-down targets, and these would be driven not by political choice, but an independent body. In the same way that we have interest rates these days that are determined by Monetary Policy Committee, yeah. um, because it took that away from politicians. I don't know if you remember in the... 70s and 80s, politicians decided what the interest rate should yep. be and it tended to reflect when an election was coming up. Well, I, I still think a lot of people today believe that the government set the interest rate today, believe it or not. And of course they don't. It's an independent commission. So that's exactly what I'd do with housing. I would set up an independent policy unit that determined what the national requirement is and then distribute those to the local authority areas, at which point then democracy takes over. So the second thing is that you allow those local authorities to choose what sites are developed in their area. That's democracy. If in the event that they start abdicating that responsibility, um, which they might do, let's face it, it's conceivable that they'll either pick sites that they know that won't be developed or, yep. or the wrong sites that are economically unviable or just choose to abdicate the responsibility and pick no sites at all. I think York have not had a local plan since 1959. Have they not? I didn't know that. So in that event, well, then the man from the ministry makes the choice for you. So it's very clear. Those are your targets, objectively set, independently set. You locally choose what sites they're on. If you choose them, great. If you don't, somebody else will choose them for you. And then, of course, the third thing that we've got to do is to start encouraging... Um, simplistic planning policies. It's just too complex. I, I've got a lot of sympathy, actually, with a lot of planning officers. Um, one or two I probably haven't got. But, <laughs> <laughs> but That's the, life. But the vast majority of planning officers, I have a huge amount of sympathy because the planning system itself is too complex. There are too many different competing layers and it's almost impossible to make a decision without trying to compromise somewhere. So the third thing is we just got to utterly simplify the, the planning system so that it's easy to become a house builder again, to regenerate more competition, uh, more startups, small, medium-sized house builders, as well as the largest house builders. Yep. So those are, those are the three things that I'd do. 
top-down targets set independently, let democracy take over in terms of choosing the sites, and if you don't choose them, the man from the ministry does, and really simplify the delivery side. I suppose we, we neither of us know the answer. Why doesn't someone that's in power, left or right, go, this is a sensible idea? It's why, 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 and we just let this gathering of people, as you say, older, more people yeah. coming in. I mean, I'm, I'm a very proud Londoner and I am very patriotic. And I, I think, you no, know, there's a reason that people come to Great Britain because it's a, it's a, I've said it before, it's a bloody amazing place. Mm-hmm. Culture, we've got a great legal system, we've been reason, we can criticise all day long. However, there are so many wonderful things here. It's quite obvious, and this is not this is not just something. It's not a personal gain situation. This is we have a problem here, but we don't seem to get that across. No, uh, you see, I don't think that generally speaking, politicians on any side of the uh, of the political divide are necessarily bad people or or don't want to fix this problem. I think the vast majority do. They're just getting too many voices in too many from too many directions with lots of initiatives. Hence, when you come back to the situation around beauty, well, if only they were more beautiful, then people would welcome yeah. them. They're in. The, the, the new homes um, bonus, remember Grant Shapps and the new homes bonus. I, I remember being told, uh, it, it was some, I think it was Grant Shapps himself at some dinner said, you know, people will be begging you to build housing in their area because they're going to get cheaper council tax. And I was thinking, well, I can think of one or two leafy suburbs in <laughs> the south where people will say, it's all right, I'll just pay more. Yeah. How about that? Exactly right. I mean, that's some, one of the things there. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, when we talk about um, the structure. I think most people in the industry know this, but since 2010, we've had 16 housing ministers. Yeah, we've had one or two good ones. But but even even that, I mean, we're not talking... We're, we're, we're talking about infrastructure. We're talking about building something. I mean, just... It, it's it, The mind boggles. Yeah. yeah. Do you know, it doesn't matter, though, what policy is put in place, whether it's a policy I choose or one chosen by somebody else. This is not going to be fixed quickly, and we have to understand that. Um, I, I think my ex-colleague, Pete Redfern, did a um, review, the Redfern Review probably five years, six years ago now, and I think he nailed it in, in that in order to reduce house prices in this country, it's going to take building 500,000 homes a year for 10 years. You're going to have to catch up, and that isn't overnight. It's over a long period of time. So you're not going to fix it quickly, and in the meantime, you probably are going to have to introduce um, assistance for, for people to help um, with with affordability, over time you've got to reduce house prices by going back to supply and demand. If there are enough homes in the country for the population, like like any other commodity, the price will settle down um, and it'll be affordable. In the meantime, though, you've got to do something from a government level to subsidise. Well, we need that. we need to get. I mean, you know, we need to get first time buyers. We need to get the ability for people to buy, as well as there's a social element as well. But until we do that, we can't get anything. And, and and the other thing is, is if you put the construction industry and the house building industry together, and then if you want to be the chancellor, the revenue that comes from people earning money in that industry, the tax revenue, exactly, it is it is domestically generated GDP. It's it's not like imports. This no. is domestically generated. Virtually all of the labour and all of the material. Is UK based. It it is a phenomenally easy way to generate growth if only you can unlock it. But as with a lot of other things in our economy, we've just become vastly unproductive. So I use a stat quite often in in our industry about how unproductive we actually are. So when I started out in the industry in 1984, typically we made a 10 percent operating margin and a 20% return on capital employed. So we turned the asset twice. Now we need to make a 20% operating profit to make a 20% return on capital because we turn the capital once. Everything is half as productive as it was in our sector in 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 1984. Well, my you know, my two of my pet hates are I think the UK's lost work ethic and, and I got people moan at me for saying that. And I also, I mean, I don't get this work from home scenario. 
certainly not in a, in a civil service, certainly not in a world where we need people there to, and also from an education point of view and, and all of it, but really that's, that we're slower today, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, we are. I think a lot more of it is around regulation and complexity. I, I think that we've forgotten that we only have the lifestyles we have due to innovation, investment and risk. Everybody's forgotten that in order to generate wealth, you have to take risk. What we seem to think we can have are the lifestyles that we've got without any risk. It doesn't work like that. And, and we just have all of these business prevention departments everywhere just to cut out the possibility that something might go wrong. Sorry, folks, stuff's going to go wrong. If we want to generate wealth, we have to innovate, be productive, and, and actually take some risks. You can't have it any other way. You can't. And then the other thing is is that the industry, you know, and I know that um, Gress Nicholson, you, you know, you've got your charity stuff. I think it's Young Lives Versus Cancer. That's right, yeah. You know, I, I saw some figures the other day that we, we as a nation, not just in this country, but we give worldwide to charity, 12 billion. Yeah, I, th- I think with charity, um, direct action is is really important. So we've got one partner who we chose last year. We did a, uh, we, we all went on on a, on a hike uh, to raise some, some money. So we closed the business for the day. Right. Um, I think about 250 out of our 750 staff took took part in this. And right. what we did is try to make it inclusive by having three different distances. So everybody converged back to one place. One place. But we had, uh, I think it was 10 miles, 15 miles and 25 miles for people to walk. So it felt as if, for some people, doing 10 miles is a real challenge. Absolutely, I'd be one of them. And and for some people, you know, doing 25 is a real challenge. But it brought everyone together. We had a dinner in the evening and and, and the awards afterwards. And and, and it was a great event. Um, And and we, we, we in the industry give... So much to charity, but I just, you know, I think there's so many things. I mean, look, listen, I know for a fact that I could talk to you all day long, uh, and I appreciate that you are a very busy guy, and I just want to thank you for coming in. Um, I certainly think our, our viewers and our listeners will be shocked pleasantly and would have learned a lot from the things that you've touched on. I, I don't think that... Um, uh I can never be exclusively right about these things. It's just it's just opinions. But we do need to get a proper debate going um, and an uncomfortable debate. And that's the bit that I don't think we've necessarily had. There are going to be other ideas which will be just as effective, but I don't think that we talk about housing enough in the political spectrum. I think we think there's an easy answer, and I'm afraid there isn't. It, it takes tough political choices. Well... You've always been inspirational when I've when I've had uh, dealings with you and I've been in your company and, and I take that on board. That's exactly the way I feel today. And I know that listeners out there will feel the same. Um, I'm going to let you go um, as much as I'd like to keep you coming on here for a while. Good luck with the Saints. Um, I quite like the idea of going to Samaritan. I never used to like going to Dell because I always thought that we got turned over. So good luck with the Saints. I hope that goes well. Um, lovely to see you thank you very much for your time um, viewers thank you for your time as well it's we are trying to get a very serious message across here um, I'm, I'm so pleased Pete found the time to come along um, stay safe be lucky Peter thank you very much absolutely cheers thank you.